Hello! Welcome back to another archaeogastronomical adventure with me, Thomas Dinas. This is the Delicious Legacy Podcast. On today's episode, we're going to explore the deep, long history of wine. Enjoy! Wine. Window into a man. Alcaeus of Mytilene. Socrates said, Wine moistens the soul. Wine, beneficial beverage, taste medicine and pleasant food. Plutarch. Wine gives a man fresh strength when he's worried. Homer. Where there's no wine, there is no love. Euripides. Nothing more excellent nor more valuable than wine was ever granted to mankind by God. Plato. Wine brings to light the hidden secrets of the soul, gives being to our hopes, bids the cow our flight, drives dull care away, and teaches new means for the accomplishment of our wishes. Horace. Wine had many, many, many fans, from philosophers to poets to politicians, and this is true even today. Let me ask you this, and be honest with me. When I say wine, what do you think? What's the first thing that comes to mind? Or rather, to give a clue, what country comes first to your lips when one says wine? Is it perhaps by any chance France? This is the place par excellence for most famous quality top top wines. And also France is one of the largest producers of wine too, and the largest exporter aside from making the best wines. And yet, and yet... What if I told you that all the wines in Europe, and of course, most of the French as well, as it is today, all these vines have um, American roots. Every single wine that we drink today from Europe, at least those big commercial varieties that uh, we are used to, they all have American roots. 150 years ago, the European wine industry was nearly wiped out of the face of the earth. A scourge erupted in Europe that seemed to be on course to destroy every single wine grape in the world. In the late 1800s, wineries all over Europe ripped up and burned their families' ancient vineyards in a desperate attempt to stop the spread of a disease. You see, the advent of steam power significantly cut the transit time across the Atlantic in the 19th century fueling a rapid establishment of experimental vineyards full of both American and hybrid vines all across France. At the time, nobody gave much thought to the possibility of plant diseases being transmitted through this unregulated trade. So amidst all this excitement surrounding the growing wine economy, the vine importers failed to notice a stowaway on their cargo. This oversight set off a biological chain reaction that would forever change how grapes would be grown across the world. But hold on, let's rewind a tiny bit. What in the name of Zeus is Phylloxera? Phylloxera laos is an insect pest of commercial grapevines worldwide, originally native to eastern North America. Phylloxera has no native predators in Europe and quickly began to spread. What does Phylloxera do? It sucks the sap out of the grapevine roots, which can kill them. It can infest a vineyard from the soles of vineyard workers' boots, or naturally spread from vineyard to vineyard by proximity. By the 1900s, phylloxera had taken a beyond immangible toll. Over 70% of the wines in France were dead. The livelihoods of thousands of families were ruined. All of a sudden, the world launched into an international wine deficit. In the 1880s, researchers discovered the only way to prevent infection was to graft resistant American rootstocks into European uh, wines. Grafting vinifera seons or shoots into phylloxera resistant American rootstocks was termed by the French reconstitution. Such a radical cure was not accepted easily. French wine growers split into two camps. The chemists who wanted to continue using insecticide treatments, 
and flooding the vines with water. Solutions that long term didn't work. And the second camp of the Americanists, often referred to as wood merchants. As the success of the American roots was demonstrated in the late 1870s and 1880s, the immense task of reconstituting virtually all the vines in France began in earnest. Reconstitution was accepted in other European countries as well, and today, with very few exceptions the world over, all vines are planted on phylloxera-resistant rootstocks. In the end, then, the American wine grape has been both a scourge and a saviour. And in time, nearly all French wine, including expensive one, comes from vines grafted onto American roots. That's right. The US has a hand in some of Europe's most venerated vintages. Incredible, really, if you think about it. The Americans, they never produced great wines up, up until the late 19th century, mid 20th century. And um, there were local grapes, local vin- vines in America, uh, which were different to European ones. So, yeah, the grapes were smaller, not less, uh, more acidic, not so juicy. So they couldn't produce the quality of wine that the Europeans uh, were used to. And um, yeah, that um, led to a lot of um, uh, vine uh, imports from Europe to America. And almost all of them, uh, they never succeeded due to the climate and due to the phylloxera bug, uh, this uh, aphid. And um, yeah, and at the end, the European uh, vineyards were all uh, polluted with phylloxera. So at the end, the American vine, who co-evolved to produce with the bug, with the aphid, managed to give a solution and thank God for that because we wouldn't have wine nowadays. Only a few areas managed to stay free of phylloxera. This aphid cannot survive in very sandy soils. So a few places in the Great Plains of Hungary, in uh, Portugal, uh, some places were immune to the attack. And Chile, which is uh, in South America, which is surrounded by Andes and the Pacific Ocean, has remained free of phylloxera. One of the few European indigenous European grapes that they are resistant to phylloxera is the Assyrtico vine, which grows in the volcanic uh, Greek island of Santorini. So there is a speculation that the actual source of this resistance may be the volcanic ash in which the vines grow. So not, uh, not the actual vine itself, but it's probably the, the soil. So these sandy or volcanic soils um, help protect the vine stalks from the attack. But um, the real um, irony of, uh, of the story is that all the traditional old uh, vines from France and most of Europe, they survived thanks to American rootstocks. Which of course begs the question, are these uh, vines uh, local varieties or something else? And it doesn't matter, or it matters of course. The point is that we have wine. The history of wine is steeped into peril, danger, and many, many myths and controversies, of course. This story, even though not ancient, is really a great story of how close the world came to be deprived of the great gift of the gods, wine, or at least how close France came to it. And this is not an isolated single incident, really. Wine-producing countries around the world were many times in danger of losing their traditions, as we will see shortly. Of course, wine is, um, especially the traditional ancient uh, vines and vineyards and grapes and ways and methods of making wine, they always faced an onslaught, an assault from modernity, from cheap uh, method productions, from uh, from industrialization and everything else. Um, it seems like all the time uh, vine growers and wine uh, producers are always in... Um, in the cusp of another, of another attack and um, another way of trying to survive, and um, because here we're talking about ancient wines and ancient methods of uh, wine production, it will be such the same if we've lost all these ancient and local varieties uh, of grapes and methods of production of wine, and we only relied in one industrialized, commercial, standardized way of production which comes from France, from modern France that is, and it's good, it's 
great, it gives you a consistent product, but would be a shame not to know about all these different wines from the world over. Today, on this first part of the history of wine, we'll go back to trace the beginnings from prehistory and also see some Greek myths about the legendary god Dionysus. And the place to start is Georgia. Something that uh, many of you might not know, or hopefully a lot of you will know, about um, Georgian wine. Yes, the country of Georgia in, uh, in Caucasus, in uh, south of Russia and uh, north of Turkey, on the shores of the Black Sea and on the slopes of the magical, mystical mountains of Caucasus. It seems like that the oldest wine in the world is from Georgia. And it seems like Stone Age farmers who lived there 8,000 years ago were the first wine producers, were grape lovers. Their rough pottery is decorated with bunches of the fruit and analysis of pollen from the site, from sites in uh, the slopes 20 miles south of the capital of Georgia, Tbilisi. It seems the analysis of pollen gives suggestions that the hillsides were decked with grapevines. The people living there and in nearby villages, the world's earliest known fitness, producing wine on a large scale as early as 6000 BC, a time when prehistoric humans were still reliant on stone and bone tools. And if this isn't impressive, then I don't know what is. Archaeological excavations of the overlapping circular houses at the site found uh, broken pottery, including uh, round bases of large jars embedded in the floors of the village house. The region's wine culture has uh, deep historical roots. There are more than 500 local uh, grape varieties in Georgia, uh, a sign that people have been breeding and growing grapes there for a long, long time. Even on crumbling Soviet-era apartment blocks, grapevines cling into the half-demolished walls. Now, the ancient method of um, making wine in Georgia relies on something called kvevri, uh, which is a large clay vessel, generally quite big. It could be I like the size of a room, uh, although smaller ones also exist. And, okay, one could, um, could say that it's similar to amphora, to ancient amphora, but it's not exactly the same thing. Basically, this large clay vessels is where the winemakers put everything into them, including the grapes, skins, and stems, and then they seal the query with wax or clay and bury it, eliminating the need for temperature control as the wine ferments. The wine clarifies on its own as the byproducts naturally rise to the top. In western Georgia, for example, large earthenware vessels used for the fermentation, storage, and aging of traditional Georgian wine. And these um, kvevri um, vessels resemble large egg-shaped amphorae without handles, and they are either buried below the ground or set into floors of large wine cellars. So some of them, uh, the, uh, these kveveries, um, they could be vary in volume from uh, 20 liters to about 10,000 liters. And usually the 800 liter capacity uh, vessels are the typical. And the entire winemaking process takes place within the kvevri, from fermentation right through to maturation. So the wines that are created this way, they have an exceptionally complex flavor and color, a very interesting color. This uh, kvevri procedure is used differently according to which part of Georgia you're in, and often determined by the climate of the region. As we've seen, regions that can be either high in altitude in the mountains or nearby the Black Sea, and as the regions get hotter, the more skins and stems tend to be fermented with the grapes. If the stems are left in the, in the wine, in the cooler regions, they can produce wines that are far too green and harsh. And alcoholic fermentation begins naturally after a few days and continues for two to four weeks, at which point uh, the cup opens and the fermented grapes are punched down twice a day during fermentation. Once that happens, the red wines are generally removed from the lees or mother, while the white wines are left with the mother. 
and then a stone lid is placed over the top of the quivery, and then the malolactic fermentation begins spontaneously soon afterwards. And this process it seems to be almost um, intact uh, since ancient times. And dare I say, I think a lot of um, ancient winemakers they used to do to make the same process. But even this amazing Georgian way of making wine, which uh, traces back to the earliest winemakers thousands of years ago, and the process has stayed intact for many, many millennia, it was in danger of being eclipsed in uh, the years of the Soviet rule. So when Georgia was part of the USSR, at the beginning, Ukraine was considered the breadbasket and Georgia was the wine uh, casket. So the vineyards were uprooted and nationalized and the grapes that were encouraged to grow were two specific grapes, Sapera V for reds and the Racitelli for whites. And they were grown for volume, not quality. A lot of people will essentially say that that was Blanc wine, sweet Blanc wine. There wasn't any character. So the biggest wineries uh, had train tracks built so that the trains could roll in and grapes or bulk wine would be just loaded in the train. From the 500 plus indigenous grapes, many of which are grown only in Georgia, they would have been lost completely if it weren't for the small family vineyards and plots that they were permitted to thrive in the countryside, alongside with the massive state-run vineyards. So Georgia's winemaking process was completely and utterly industrialized. And the approach obviously was based on the classic five-year plan instituted by the Soviets, uh, which gathered the specialist strength under Stalin after World War II. So to make any money, the growers had to sell low-quality wine produced on large scales. And it was so poor that uh, apparently even the winemakers wouldn't drink it. They would just export it to Soviet countries. So the traditional practice of winemaking in the Kvevri was absolutely marginalized. Of course, you know, as a process, um, the producer of wine fermented in these uh, clay vessels buried underground. It's impossible to produce wine on a commercial level. So all this is made by hand, cleaned by hand, harvest and scrub the, the clay pots for two weeks. So it's, it, it's, it requires meticulous care and attention, something that the Soviet style of bulk making wine making uh, couldn't accomplish. And not, not only the Soviet rule um, industrialized the growing and the making of wine, but also reduced significantly the amount of land devoted uh, to grape growing in Georgia. And then around 1985, uh, much of Georgia's vineyards were ripped out when uh, Gorbachev launched a campaign to combat alcohol abuse. And the total vineyard space was reduced to a quarter of its original size. So from 395,000 acres to about 111,000 acres. We came very close to losing all the Georgian wines. Luckily, the industry nowadays... The traditional way of making Georgian wine seems to have found a second uh, life. There is a renaissance on uh, wine making in Georgia, and there's so many different varieties, and most of them rely on the traditional old method, which is great. Today's episode is brought to you with the welcome support of Malbin Greek, UK's leading Greek delicatessen, supplier, and distributor of premium Greek produce be it wine, herbs, cheeses or olive oil, from all over the wild corners of the country and working directly with family and artisan producers. Why not, or why not, try the Ktima Vurvukeli Limnio, a red wine from Avdira, North Greece, the homeland of Democritus. Limnio is a truly ancient and very much praised red wine since antiquity and from no other than Aristotle himself. Deep red, Fraboise color with red forest fruits in the aroma, along with black pepper, cardamom and curry notes, spicy texture and long aftertaste. Or if you prefer a white wine, then the special Domaine Sigalas Barrel Sandorini PDO Assyrtico is for you. A barrel fermented Assyrtico 
which demonstrates the aging qualities of the variety, deep lemon color and a complex nose with citrus fruits and wood notes, round and smooth in the mouth with the acidity being the backbone that allows it to age. The vines are classified as old vines and are over 50 years in age. The rejuvenation of the vineyards employs the same technique from antiquity to the present day. This is truly a unique wine that deserves to be more well known. Whatever you need, Malbian Greek has you covered. You can shop online and have the divine and delicious goods delivered to your doorstep across the UK or you can visit the shop at Art17 Apollo Business Park, Lucy Way, SC16, 4ET, Bermondsey, London. Malby and Greek, the one-stop shop for your Greek fix. So, how wine was transmitted from its roots in Georgia to the rest of the world? As various populations abandoned the nomadic life, took up agriculture and settled down, from the end of the 6th millennium BCE to the middle of the 4th, the cultivation and exploitation of vine came down through Asia Minor and into Egypt. Cuneiform texts from Mesopotamia mention trade treaties around the 3rd millennium. The vine and wine reached Crete, no doubt crossing from Egypt to the southern shores of the island or reaching its eastern coastline from Phoenicia, at the time when the first trade contacts were being established between the Mediterranean peoples. From Crete, the vine moved on to Greece, from Greece to Sicily, southern Italy and Libya. During the Bronze Age, the vine and wine spread on in several directions, reaching India by the way of Persia and coming to Britain along the amber and tin trade routes. Much later from the Bronze Age, in the Great Age of Greek colonization of the Mediterranean. In Provence, according to the ancient geographer Strabo, the first vine stocks were brought to Massalia by Phocian colonists who founded the city of Massalia, modern Marseille. It is almost certain that the first vineyards in France were on the hillsides of Palette, sheltered from the Mistral by Mont Saint-Victoire near Aix and out of reach of the arrows of the Salai tribesmen of Entremont. So from uh, Georgia, we can imagine that the uh, winemaking process spread across uh, uh, the Middle East and the Mediterranean. And obviously the first civilizations that started making wine were the peoples from Mesopotamia and Egypt. And um, we have some evidence from archaeological and written records from uh, Mesopotamia, Assyria and Egypt about, about that especially from Egypt, we have various illustrations which uh, show some of the stages of uh, wine making. And from there, it can be seen that the grapes were pressed by treading, usually in a, in a festive occasion. In other illustrations, the grapes are on a, a raised vat so that the juice falls in, into it and then runs through funnels into foyer vats. And then, yeah, and then there's other methods of pressing the grapes in a cloth, and so on. Afterwards, fermentation, which was apparently carried out in large pointed bottom storage jars, the wine was filtered through cloth to remove the lees, and the wine was stored in jars and different types of wine might be mixed together before drinking. At a similar time, in the ancient past, in Mesopotamia, um, wine had become a regular part of the diet by the Neo-Assyrian period, uh, different varieties are listed in, um, in a lot of uh, documents that uh, archaeologists found, including strong wine, sweet wine, and vinegar, and those coming from different countries, uh, such as Izali, Publunu, Baburun, and so on. Skins of wine, as well as bunches of grapes, were included in the provisions for Asurpanipal's feast. Issues of wine were made as part of the regular rations for personnel of the citadel, and it formed part of the provisions for the army. Vine was also used as a part of the king's meals, as tribute and in rituals, and grapes by themselves were used as an offering to the gods. From there, the wine spread to Phoenicia, and the Phoenicians were great uh, seafarers and marines and traders and uh, from there spread all across the Mediterranean thanks to them and there might be a possible the way that wine spread across 
Greece uh, is possibly through Crete. That's where we have the oldest evidence of wine making in Crete about 4,000 years ago. But possibly the Cretans got it from uh, Phoenicians. Ancient Phoenicians, they were trading in wine as well. And um, recently there was a discovery of uh, the oldest wine press in Lebanon. So ancient Phoenicia was in the coastal from what we call today Syria and uh, Lebanon. So in the ancient coastal city of Sidon, excavations revealed the well-preserved remains of a wine press from at least the 7th century BC. And this is the earliest wine press ever found in the Phoenician homelands. Large numbers of seeds show grapes were brought there from nearby vineyards and crushed by treading feet in large basin of durable plaster that could hold about 1,200 gallons of raw juice. The resulting must was collected in large vat and stored in distinctive pottery jars known as amphorae for fermenting, aging and transport. And from there, we move to Greece, to Crete and Greece. And again, we have another situation here that uh, traditional and um, old indigenous varieties were almost lost forever. Basically, wine production in Greece was really poor and um, the wine produced was essentially, again, quite a cheap plonk, really. And um, by the time, by after World War II, especially, and as late as the, the 80s, uh, most of the vineyards, they started pulling out all the ancient varieties, all the, all the, all the indigenous varieties of, of um, vines, and planted a lot of international varieties to produce wine according to the French method. But luckily, again, luckily, we managed to come out of this uh, mentality and thought and indigenous varieties were saved and now thriving and produce some quality wines. There are about 300 different grape varieties in Greece. And uh, yeah, Crete has the oldest tradition and history of winemaking, 4,000 years of wine history. The history of wine and history of Greece are both intertwined <laughs> and uh, lived together for many millennia. And wine played and still plays an important role in the traditions and the culture of uh, Greek people. And we all know God Dionysus, the God that has been connected uh, early on with the vine and the wine and um, with this beloved Homeric alcoholic beverage. Initially, Dionysus was, of course, the God of wild nature. And through the Greek myths, we can find out a lot about the adventures of uh, Dionysus and how, how the viniculture, viticulture in Greece had started. As we've seen, uh, Greeks didn't invent the wine. It was invented somewhere in southern Caucasus, between Turkey, Georgia, Armenia, Iran. But Greeks did something even better. By making Dionysus its patron, they immortalized it. Aside from giving wine a god, right? A god of its own. The Greeks also invented... What else? Philosophy. Now, is that a coincidence? I'm not so sure it is. The myth of the introduction of wine to the Greek people tells us Dionysius transformed himself into a bunch of grapes to seduce Erigone. She later hung herself beside the tomb of her father Icarius, the first person in Attica to welcome the new god and introduce the drinking of wine. Her father was murdered because according to the same myth, the people of Attica drank too much, became intoxicated, thought they had been poisoned and killed the unfortunate Icarius. Such episodes were regrettable, of course, but the dual theme of bloodshed, human blood exchange for the blood of the vine, recurred regularly. Wine is associated with love, and one of the characteristics of Dionysus, the Greek god of wine, may be described as love of humanity. He gave mankind wine to make men happier, of course, including himself. Another myth from ancient Greece tells us that Amphictyon taught people to mix water with their wine. The inhabitants of Attica before him, as mentioned above, had failed to take that precaution, thought they were ill, 
and revenge themselves on Icarius by murdering him. Amphictyon himself was one of the sons of Defcalion, the Greek Noah. Before wine was supposed to have been revealed by Dionysius in Crete, and then in Attica and the Peloponnese, as we've seen, it has been known to the Akkadians, Sumerians, Hittites, Assyrians, Hebrews and Egyptians, who all understood its effects. What other legends exist about the god of wine Dionysus? Different traditions ascribe different mothers to Dionysus, the son of Zeus. Some legends make him the son of Persephone, the spring, with whom the lord of Olympus lay in the form of a snake. In this tradition, Dionysus is born with a crown of snakes on his head. All the traditional legends say that Hera, the deceived wife of Zeus, tried to do away with the child. He is also said to have been the son of Lithi, Oblivion, or Dione, the oak, a tree over which the wild vine frequently climbs. The most common myth, however, is that Zeus lay with Semele, the priestess of the moon and daughter of Cadmus, the founder of Thebes. The jealous Hera, disguised as an old woman, advised Semele to ask Zeus for proof that he really was a god. Semele had already conceived Dionysus when she asked her lover this question. He unconsciously appeared to her armed with his thunderbolts, and Semele perished in the lighting. But Zeus had time to snatch the premature baby from the ashes, and with the assistance of Hermes, hit the child in his thigh. When the baby came to term, Hermes delivered him. Dionysus was thus twice born. Then Hermes, fleet-footed with his winged sandals, carried the child away to Mount Nyssa, where beautiful nymphs lived in a deep and marvelous cave. On the arrival of Hermes and his precious burden, the moon in her glory illuminated the sky, and a star appeared on the mountain peak. The nymphs laid the newborn baby in a golden cradle, fed him on honey, and gave him bunches of grapes from the vine growing around the cave to play with. They crowned him with ivy and taught him to play the cymbals. Some legends say that Hermes turned Dionysus into a goat to convey him to this safe place, and thereafter the animal was sacred to the god who kept its horns. Dionysus had tamed two lion cubs, which drew his chariot when they were fully grown, as he set out to conquer the world. He achieved his aim when he pressed the juice of grapes into a golden cup and offered the purple nectar to the nymphs, to the satyrs and Silene who felt such joy as they had never known before, wishing to dispel the cares and griefs of mortal men and make them feel briefly the equals of gods, Dionysus set across the world, followed by his intoxicated train. One legend says that Hera, taking her revenge for his beauty, turned him and his followers half mad. Altogether, there is a wide variety of legends. Dionysus next took ship on a vessel shaped like the crescent moon. The first man he met was Icarius of Attica. As thanks for his welcome, he gave him the gift of wine. Unfortunately, for the people of Attica, we've seen what happened. Lycurgus, king of Thrace, was jealous of Dionysus and trying to lure him into an ambush, but he killed his own son under the delusion that he was cutting down vines. Dionysus had escaped by throwing himself into the sea, where his followers tore their enemy to pieces. The god was picked by the pirates who held him prisoner. Thereupon he made a vine grow around the mast of the ship and turned the ringing into snakes and himself into a lion. At a sign from him the wind played music into the sails, which sprouted flowers. The pirates went mad, jumped overboard and were turned into dolphins. The ship carrying the god set sail for Naxos, where Ariadne, abandoned by the faithless Theseus, was lamenting. He married her and in the joyful festivities of the wedding, celebrated by satyrs, he flung the bride's crown so high to the sky that it became the constellation of Corona Borealis, the northern crown. The couple lived happily ever after and had six children. Having conquered the world as far as Libya, India and beyond, to the sound of flutes, pan pipes, tambours and cymbal, Dionysus wished to take his ease at the table of the gods. But he would not stay there while his mother was still held captive in the underworld, 
and he bought her freedom from Persephone with a bunch of myrtle. While Semele was recovering in the temple of Artemis, he asked her to change her name to avoid trouble with any of the Olympian gods who were about to welcome him into their company. She became Thyone, the vexed queen, and hand in hand, mother and son ascended to the heavens. Hera was not pleased, but said no more about it. And this is it for today's episode. Thank you for listening. Next time, we will dive deep into the ancient Greek wine world, the different Greek grape varieties which still exist today, explore what ancient Romans liked, hint, it was Greek wine, and generally learn about wine culture in ancient Greece, the symposium and all the wine drinking implements of the ancients. I've been Thomas Dinos, and this was the Delicious Legacy Podcast. Please rate and review wherever you get your podcasts from, Spotify, Apple, Google, and leave us a five-star review. It helps more people to discover this podcast, and I'll be incredibly grateful. Thank you, and goodbye.